My name is Steve Kinney, and I am the director of the front end engineering program at the Turing School of Software and Design out in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Turing is uh, one of those developer training programs, but a little bit different because it's a seven month developer training program uh, and a nonprofit. Uh, and we're always looking for people who want to be our friends and hang out with us. Uh, Lori was out visiting us last Friday, and that was super cool. And if anyone else wants to come and talk to our amazing students or work with us for a little bit or spend a week with us, we got a bunch of alumni in the room, uh, some other instructors, so please come find any of us and talk to us, because we really like to meet amazing humans. Um, I also have stickers that'll make the whole like social interaction less awkward. That'd be really great. Um, you say, hey, can I have a sticker? And I, I will give you a sticker. Um, I actually also have a few Dinosaur JS stickers because they were in my bag. So I can also give you those as well. They're the black ones, not the cool blue ones. But they're cool, um, and I can give you those as well. I'm um, also working on a book called Electron in Action, and I also have like codes for like four free copies of that um, that I scrolled on uh, business cards that you can get from me later as well. Uh, so there's lots of like topics of conversation before I eventually convince you to come out to Denver and hang out with us. Um, and so Turing's an important part of this talk. Um, one of the things about being a seven month program, as opposed to like a 12 week or whatever, is towards months like six and seven, you have a lot of like time to get really weird with things. Right, like you've made a form and you've submitted stuff, you've made a shopping cart, you've done, you've done the web development thing, right? And, and what happens is towards the end we have to really start like um, reaching uh, to keep you occupied and convince you that this is still a good idea. Um, so one of the projects we did in the kind of the final weeks of Turing is to have our students build an application, uh, build an electron application that used Ember on the front end, right? And this is an example of one of them. It's a little notes application. You write in some markdown and you get like the pretty HTML format. You can just log into GitHub and publish it to a gist. Uh, it writes to the file system so it works totally offline. And it's really cool. The problem is that there's a few moving parts. Like Node generally likes callbacks, Ember likes promises, so on and so forth, right? A lot of the kind of Node file system APIs will go ahead and like, you know, um, get you the list of all the names of the files, but you also want what the contents of the files. Um, so the main learning goal here was to kind of get comfortable with Ember and get comfortable with Electron, not like also like kind of deal with the impedance mismatch of like callback driven like APIs versus promise ones. So the morning before, I made a little NPM module that basically only did part of the job, right? It basically, it, it had a promise kind of API, but it did the callbacks under the hood, and all it did was read files and list all the files in a directory, and it would filter out like your DS stores and your .vim undo files and stuff like that. So you can give it a file extension and just a few things, but it didn't do everything. So part of the project with students was also to like implement all of the other features. Right, implement the ability to remove files, to update files, all sorts of things like that. Um, so I kind of just did the bare bones and handed it to them and kind of opened up a bunch of issues and assigned it. And a really weird, I got a really weird reaction. A bunch of students asked me, how did you get permission to put a module on NPM? And like, my job is to like think about the beginner's mindset, right? But this totally caught me off guard. I'm like, don't need permission to publish one. Um, and I, was, it was, I started to think about it uh, more and more. So we kind of like scrapped the schedule for the next day, and we're like, all right, we're all gonna publish a module to NPM together and individually, and like this is a thing that you can do, right? Because part of my job is to build people who can like go get jobs as developers. The other part of my job is to build really amazing humans that can be part of the community, be citizens of the open source community, be participants in it. Um, I started thinking about this 1% rule. Right, and the idea is that like of any given online community, 1% of all people like actually contribute and 99% of people just kind of like lurk, right? And sometimes there's like 1% contribute, 9% um, like kind of, 1% uh, create, 9% kind of like edit Wikipedia articles. I think one time um, there was like, they spelled York Street wrong in a, um, in a Wikipedia article about New York City, and I fixed that. That's my contribution to Wikipedia. Um, but generally speaking, uh, or they called it Avenue A, I don't remember. Because um, it's not. It's before First Avenue, but it's not Avenue A. Um, 
So with, I asked Lori for some numbers, right? And what we find out is that NPM has about 250,000 registered users, right? But you don't need to be logged into NPM in order to like download a module, right? So how many people really use it? Uh, Lori's guess was about 4.5 million people, right? That's a lot of humans. Uh, of that, 84,000 have actually like, you know, contributed and published a module to the registry. And that comes in at, you guessed it, around 1%. So only 1% of people have actually published to the registry. And my goal today is if you've never published a module to the NPM registry to show you that it is totally a thing that you can do and totally a thing that you should do. Um, and if you have, if you're you know, one of the kind of subset of people who've been using NPM before it was included in Node, then like hopefully there's a few tricks that you can pick up to make life easier. Because one thing I realized is that almost anything that might cause you some friction, there's actually like some kind of NPM setting or NPM command that gets you around it. Cool. So we're gonna make a little module today for working with rectangles. Right, because this is, this is a talk about publishing NPM, it's not a talk about watch me live code a module in 25 minutes. Um, cool, so I wanted to make a module for rectangles. Unfortunately, we have a module already with the name rectangle, and you can see, I don't know what it does because it doesn't have any documentation, but um, <laughs> I can make some assumptions, right? Um, so we have a few options, right? We have to come up with a new name. Um, Option one is we can have a scoped module. I can say that it's going to be uh, at Steve Kennedy slash rectangle. Option two is to get a little bit creative. So I went to an anagram generator. And this, if you type in rectangle, these are all the words that still have, these are all the other words that have the same letters as rectangle. So what we did as a class, we made nectar leg. Uh, but I couldn't use that because now nectar leg is taken for this talk. So we're going to use trans leg instead. Um, so we will have to post a README and some documentation because it is not going to be clear from the name what this module does. Um, and so how do we get started, right? Well, we open up our little command line and we can go ahead and just make a new folder, right? Just hop on in and head in there. All right. And I think as Isaac said before, like NPM got a lot of its start from just having a package.json, right? And so what we need to do is create a package.json. Except like, uh, like, I can't remember the rules of JSON. It's like double quoted keys, you can't have a trailing comma. It's almost like it's trying to hurt your feelings sometimes. Um, luckily, we don't really have to deal with that, right? We have, we have tools that like save us from like trying to figure out where we messed up uh, getting our JSON in order, right? So we can go ahead and hit npm init. And this is a little fun tool that will kind of like ask you a series of questions, like helping you to figure out like which Disney character you are, but this is for your module. Um, so, and it has a lot of like sensible defaults, which are really cool. It's like, hey, you're in a folder called Transleg. I'm like, thank you for noticing. Uh, you probably want to name this module Transleg. I'm like, you're right, I do. Uh, what version would you like it to be, right? And you, it'll give you a suggestion of 1.0.0. You can be a contrarian and do 0.0.1, whatever, right? Um, and then a description. And so ours is going to be a very important module for working with rectangles. And an entry point. This is when somebody NPM installs your module and they do like require transleg, like where do we start? Right, what, what is the entry file of this? Because like, I, I could break stuff out into multiple files, but this is, this is where it starts. Uh, if you have something, if you already have a file like server.js or like main.js, npm will be really smart and try its best to figure out what file it was, but if, this is just an empty directory, so we're gonna get index.js, which seems reasonable to me. A test command, right, and you can like say, I wanna use Mocha, or I wanna use a make file, or whatever, right? Anyone you want, you kinda like put it in there. If you don't put any, it'll like just echo an error that you didn't write tests, um, and kind of like just shame you. Uh, Git repository, which we'll kinda round back to later. Some keywords for finding it, right, because again, I have a terribly named module. Uh, so we could say stuff like rectangle, quadrilateral, geometry, just kind of like search terms. All right, who the author is, right, that is me. You should not use this, you should use your name. Um, what license you wanna do, ISC is the default, MIT, you can use a Mozilla public license, whatever one makes you happiest, you kinda of put in there. You should also have a license file in there as well. Uh, and it's like, hey, this is the package JSON I'm gonna make for you, is this cool? And the default answer is yes. And now you have a package.json in your folder, and it's all perfectly formatted, and you have everything that you need. And you can change this, because it's just a JSON file. If you're like, I made a boo-boo, you just go ahead, you can change it and save the file, it's totally fine. But at least like the hard work of like 
giving, getting everything in order, making sure you have all the right fields has been done for you. But you're like, my name doesn't change that often, right? Um, so it'd be cool if I could just like save that. So do, do I have to type it in every time? And the answer is no. Uh, you can actually go ahead and set some configuration options. You can be like, hey, when I'm doing NPM in the NIT, my name is Steve Kinney, or your name. Um, and, I mean, if you want to publish modules under my name, if they're good, that's totally okay. Um, an email address you can, you can set. You can also set like a website um, for where they can find more about you. And now, if you do NPM in it, it'll ask you a bunch of questions. It won't ask you for your name anymore. And it'll actually fill it in for you. Right, so now you have this kind of like setting done and in place. The other hard part is like, I don't even, like, I don't want to type in the whole Git URL every time. So the good news is that you don't necessarily have to. If you kind of start the workflow a little bit differently, and you start by creating a new repository, and setting it up, and then cloning it down, and then you just clone the, you clone the repository, like instead of creating a folder, you're just gonna clone the repo down. And you can go ahead and CD into it and run npm init, it's actually gonna do a bunch of things for you. It's gonna fill in this repository automatically. It's also, when your rectangle library becomes very popular, people are gonna have, people have requests on the internet. Uh, people have opinions. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever noticed this. Um, and so it's where they can file bugs, the, the home page becomes, in this point, the, the readme for the GitHub repo, so on and so forth. Uh, but sometimes I have a habit of just typing npm init, just slamming on the enter key. Right, like whatever. Like I'm teaching, I just need to get started here. It's cool. Can I just skip all this? And the answer is yes. <laughs> no, literally, you just be like, hey, npm init, like it's cool. I'm just gonna slam on the enter key. And you can like form a working relationship where it's just gonna like fill in the defaults for you. Defaults of your name, defaults of the repo if you have all that set up. You just npm dash dash yes or dash y and you're good to go. All right, so now we have to make, we've talked a lot about like getting set up, now we have to make this module. And this is one of my, this is like one of my favorite moves to pull on students, is I'm gonna show you just enough to get started, and then like, I'm going to like, now it's your turn to kind of like, uh, go ahead and do it. And like, I can see, I can see the alumni laughing right now. Um, and so if I show them this picture, I no longer have to feel bad about it. And that's the important part. <laughs> uh, is how do I sleep at night, really? Um, all right, so we can make a rectangle function, and then we can export it, and maybe it takes some arguments, and we set them, and we give it some cool methods, like figuring out the perimeter. I am very bad at math, so this is where I start to like hit the wall on what I can do with a rectangle. Um, so we have that, and remember, the people are gonna use this code. It can't be like, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna deploy it. If something breaks, I'll fix it later. People are gonna rely on this very important rectangle module that you made, and it's up to you to make sure that everything works. So we're gonna write some tests to go along with it. Uh, we can npm install Mocha, or whatever. Like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get into a fight about this. Um, <laughs> and, but you can npm install Mocha, but you wanna make sure everyone else working on this module also knows that they need Mocha. So you could say dash dash save, Right, which would be like when someone clones it down, they should get Mocha, except they don't, they're not gonna run the test suite, they're just using it, right? So we could say dash dash save dash dev, which is gonna be like, all right, if you're just using this module, you don't need the whole like test runner, but if you're gonna be like working on it, if you clone it down and do npm install to like work on this very important rectangle module, then in that case, you ought to have Mocha there. Um, if you don't like typing dash dash save, you can just do dash capital S, uh, dash capital D, for, say, for saving as a dev uh, dependency. You can also misspell install. Um, and I like to take it a little bit further. Um, or you can also just do npm and i if you like have settled with the fact that you're never gonna spell install correctly. Um, if, if it's like around 11.30 and I'm programming, I usually make this typo where I'll type like nom install. <laughs> so you can alias that over. And now you can be a very mature developer and you can do this and get Mocha installed. Um, if you forget to save stuff, you can always like set it to save something to your package.json, right? And if, if it's a boo-boo, you can always remove it because it's a JSON file. Um, or you can say like, hey, and this exact version. And these are settings that now forever it will automatically save it. And you can move it around and do stuff like that. Um, so here we have some tests, like it should do the thing. Um, that's important. And we can run our tests. And one thing you might notice is I didn't like globally install Mocha, 
right? It's just like a dependency of my particular module. And one of the cool things is in your package.json, you have this scripts um, like list of like different scripts that you might want to run. What's cool about this is that anything in here, the path of your like binaries for your node modules that you have installed locally to that project is added when you run it. So if I ran um, MBM test, it's going to run Mocha relative to that project, the one I have installed. So this means you could have Mocha installed at like, I don't know what the version of Mocha is right now, to be really honest. Uh, but you can have like a previous version installed on a different project and you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, if real quick we said echo which mocha as we run it, you'll see that it's actually scoped, that was the wrong way to zoom, uh, it's actually scoped to the project, right? So like we can have it installed for each and every one of them. Um, but then we want to get a little fancy with our rectangle module, right? It works and that's not good enough for us. Um, we're going to take our fun little prototypal inheritance thing and we're going to use Ash's favorite feature of ES6 classes. Um, <laughs> And we're going to do that. And we're going to change these uh, perimeter area methods to computed properties. And it's going to be really great and wonderful. And then that's cool. But your boss comes in and says, like, hey, uh, node 0, 10 is a thing. Uh, and people use it, like, a lot. Um, and, like, you can't necessarily do that. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's sad. But we could, for instance, say, like, hey, these are the versions of Node that we support, right? And this is opt-in. Like, somebody could still kind of, like, override this. But we could define, like, I'm supporting these versions of Node. Um, but I think there's a more important thing here. Because, yes, there could be ES6 features. But you might love CoffeeScript or TypeScript or, like, whatever, right? And it's cool that you write your packages in that language. Like, good on you. Like, I'm glad that you're making stuff. But, like, I shouldn't need to have a CoffeeScript transpiler to use that thing. Right? So we can write in whatever language we want, but we should be publishing that module for the widest possible audience. So whatever, we can just TypeScript, ES6, CoffeeScript. In this case, we did, in fact, like kind of use a little bit of like ES6. Um, so what we can do is we can go ahead and like just install some tools. Right? We're going to write in the latest, greatest versions of JavaScript, but we want it available for anyone who can run like ES5 or anything like that. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll make a little Babel RC. That's fun. Um, cool. And we could do this every time we're, we've made an important change to our module. We could say dot slash node modules dot bin slash babel from source rectangle JS to output to index JS, because that's the entry point of our module. Or we can be really honest with ourselves and realize that we're never going to remember to do this. Right? We're going to want to do it, we're just never going to remember to do it. So what we could do is we could add it to our scripts in our package.json. We say npm run build. And that'll be scoped to just right. We don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and so we can run that, and it'll go ahead and build everything for us. Except we're probably going to forget to do that, too. Like, we've made it easier, but we haven't solved the core problem of we're not going to remember to do it. Uh, unless you're better than me, and then you might. Um, so we've got these, like, these friendly NPM scripts that we use all the time. Publish, test, install, start. Um, but they also come, like, when you run NPM start, Right, you actually run npm pre-start, npm start, npm post-start, right? And so you can do things beforehand, right? We can look at npm pre-publish, which means I'm going to publish this TypeScript or CoffeeScript module that I worked on, right? Before it goes up to the registry, let's go turn that into like, you know, like universal like JavaScript, right? Same thing with like pre-install, post-install. There are different hooks that allow you to hook into the whole process and have like custom functionality, so you can kind of automate it and remove yourself from having to remember to do certain things. Um, cool. So here we'll say npm prepublish is going to run npm run build. And we can do other stuff in here. We could like also eslint and test. So we make sure it's linted and tested before we push it up. Whatever you want to do. You can also, like, npm run build is our own, like, custom script that we made, right? There's nothing special about it. That's why we had to use run beforehand. You could have npm run sandwich, and I don't, it'll do something. Uh, it'll do whatever you say it does. Uh, the cool part is that npm will also run npm pre-sandwich, which is like pull up the, the like, Jimmy John's app, uh, npm sandwich, and then npm post-sandwich, which will just like echo take a nap. Uh, and these will run now every time, and you'll get that for free. Uh, cool. The thing is, I need to, like, that fancy pants code that I wrote before, I do want to commit that to version control, because that's the code I'm working on, but I don't need to ship that code that they're not running with them, right? Uh, so I don't want to ship all of those ES6 source files or the CoffeeScript or TypeScript or what have you source files, but I do want to have them in Git. So I, 
I need like, that kind of like, difference. I'm not shipping them, but I do want to have them around. Uh, just like you have a git ignore, you can actually have an npm ignore. Right? And these are the files that will not ship with your project. And there's certain things kind of already built in there that won't ship with it, like uh, log files and stuff like that. Um, we're going to say our source file, which is all that ES6 that we wrote, is in there. And that will now not publish. But we could also commit it to git, which is kind of cool. Very important, we want to, like, one of the big improvements of Transleg is that it comes with a readme. Um, the other cool fact is, if you already have the readme, what NPM will do was it'll look at the first line that doesn't have a pound sign in front of it, right? So the first line that's not clearly like a markdown header, and it will actually set that as the description of your module if you do NPM init and you already have a readme. So you'll also get that for free, too. Um, cool. If you've never published something in NPM before, if you are one of the um, 4.5 million minus 84,000 people, um, you can go ahead and create an account right from the command line. If you already have an account, you can just log in. And then you just, this is how you get the permission to publish to NPM. This is the kind of main part of the talk. You just type in NPM publish. And that's, now your module is, it's up. You published it. Um, so we'll run that. And we'll see that it published. And here it is on the NPM registry, right? Transleg, available today. I'm announcing this new module that you can use today in all your projects, Transleg. Um, now, again, people have opinions. So the feature requests come in, the bug requests come in, and stuff along those lines. And let's say we started at that 1.0.0. Um, I was talking a little bit about semantic versioning, right? And the idea is, if we do a little tiny like change, or we fix like a we fix a bug, but it doesn't change the way we work with the module, doesn't add any new features, right? We can say npm version patch, and it will bump us up from 1.0.0 to 1.0.1. If we add some new features, right, we can go ahead and like do a minor version bump, right? This is say, hey, I didn't break anything because I have those tests and they're still passing, right? But we have we have some like new stuff you can get along the way. And if I break something. Right, just to let you know, like, if you were relying on Translate before for your very important rectangle work, uh, something like when I switched from those methods to computed properties, that would break all, all the 1.0 user's code, right? So I want to let them know, like, this is a big deal, right? And we can do an NPM version major. And that seems neat, but we also get some free things with that, right? It'll, it will update our package.json. It will also make some commits on our behalf, right, which is super cool. Um, and it will also use, it will also set like git tags for each one of those version commits, right? All for us, like we don't have to really think about it. Once we have that, we can, we can publish, right? And congratulations, like you did it. You, you now um, have all, all the information you need to know um, about, to publish stuff onto NPM. And like on one hand, like JavaScript is a wonderful language with its like fair share of like rough edges. And the cool part is that we can then create solutions that we can share as a community, which I think is really important. Even better is that JavaScript is always like finding its way like to find, to do new things, right? Like we can program robots with it. We can, you know, we can do, we can do it on the server now. Did you hear about that? Um, we can make desktop applications with JavaScript, right? And as we keep like pushing the language forward, there's like new needs and new like kind of places where we might need to have shared solutions. So once you, once you think about yourself as somebody who can create and contribute to the community and you kind of start getting in the habit, like we are all better off for it, right? So like hopefully if, you've, if you felt like I, I don't know how to do this, I don't, like, I don't have permission to do this, you, I have now given you permission. You have permission to publish NPM modules now. Like, it's an extra gift. Um, so thank you so much. Um, cool.